Good morning, everyone. My name is Kat Fries. I am a second year full-time MBA student here at UCLA Anderson. And I am so excited to be sitting across from my lovely keynote speaker. I have my notes because I want to ensure that I uh, capture all the amazingness that is Ann Walsh. So Ann Walsh is the managing partner of Guggenheim Partners and is the chief investment officer of Guggenheim Partners Investment Management, providing the vision to guide the firm's investment strategies, managing over $250 billion worth of assets. Walsh, whose career in financial services spans nearly four decades, joined Guggenheim Partners in 2007. Walsh's professional accomplishments include, as of yesterday, being named to Barron's Top 100 Most Influential Women in U.S. Finance for the fifth year in a row, which is the total number of years, by the way, that they've had this award. She is also the CIO of the Year at the 2022 Women in Asset Management Awards and the Lifetime Achievement Award at the Market Media Group's 2022 Women in Finance Awards. Walsh holds a BSBA and an MBA from Auburn University, a JD from the University of Miami School of Law, and as well as the right to use the Chartered Financial Analyst designation as a member of the CFA Institute. She is also a committed philanthropist and is a strong advocate for greater representation of women and asset management through Guggenheim's investment support of the Girls Who Invest program. Now, Mrs. Walsh is all amazing, and I know her under one other very important title, and it's one that I have had for her for my 26 young years of living, and that is the title of mom. <laughs> And it is a true honor and a pleasure to sit up here at my MBA program's Velocity Conference and interview my mom. So with that, hi, Mom. Hi, Kat. <laughs> Are you ready to get started? Absolutely. Let's do it. All right, let's kick it off. I've also got a ton of questions. And we'll do about, I said 42 minutes on the clock. We'll do about 35-ish minutes of questions. And then we'll open it up to the audience. And you can ask my mom anything you want to know. <laughs> All right, let's kick it off. So we're, first, we're going to talk about overcoming challenges. This, is all, this conference is all about empowerment. So what is an example of a challenge or a setback that you faced in your career? And what strategy did you find most effective in navigating it? Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me today um, at this uh, wonderful event. Uh, and it's great to see all of you. Um, you know, in 40 years in investment management, uh, I can tell you that uh, I've had to overcome many challenges. Um, when I started in the business, I was often the only female in the room. Um, to add to the Dean's remarks uh, with regard to some statistics, sadly, in the investment management business, which to me seems like an amazing opportunity for women, um, we are still terribly underrepresented um, with only uh, now, we finally have moved into double digits. We now have 11% of portfolio managers who are women. That's a pathetically low number. Um, within financial services, we're still underrepresented as, a, as a, a, a participants with about a third uh, of financial services um, participants are now women. So within that, we, we can talk about all the challenges um, of, uh, of trying to uh, uh, set the tone, if you will, for change in the industry. Um, I think over the course of time, uh, we've had challenges, markets change, um, work opportunities change, um, and, uh, and, and there have been so many challenges over the course of time. Maybe I'll pick out a few uh, examples of that may be relevant to all of you sitting here in terms of trying to navigate your own careers and your own futures. So if I look back, uh, probably one of the most challenging decades to work in the investment management industry was the 1980s. And one could make the argument that the 1980s was kind of challenging for lots of businesses, not just investment management. But we were really undergoing quite a bit of, um, of, of difficulty. Um, we had the first of our significant market events, 1987, we had the market uh, crash 25% in one day. Uh, that was a, a, a significant milestone. Um, but 
in my own career, I was at that time uh, really working hard to uh, gain respect uh, from colleagues um, uh, as uh, one of the very few women in, in the investment management business, even at that time. And I remember a circumstance where I was um, uh, having to solve for an investment management problem, i.e. market volatility, uh, and yet getting pushback from colleagues, uh, in particular male colleagues, uh, who found uh, the, uh, that, that working in a diverse uh, setting was, uh, was mm, for them, challenging. Uh, and uh, and, and uh, how did I overcome it? Well, I don't take no for an answer. Um, that's maybe the start. I just don't believe in the first answer being one that, that is uh, unacceptable. So I keep fighting. Uh, and, and maybe that's the first thing. I felt I could believe in myself. And having the ability to know your own talent and know what you're trying to accomplish is really important in trying to overcome challenges. So if someone says to you, you can't do something, my answer is, why not? And, uh, and, and I'll start back even before then. Um, my father was a tremendous person, your grandfather. Uh, and, uh, and he was a military officer. And he was highly supportive uh, of the women in the family. Um, my mother, uh, been a military wife, uh, but also wanted to uh, be professionally employed as an attorney. And so midlife, she went back to law school so that she could become an attorney. And when my father retired from the military, she went to work full time. Uh, they basically traded careers. And so he was very supportive of her. But oddly enough, I was in college and I was sort of finding it a hard time to even get a job. Uh, and I had been an accounting uh, undergrad and I was going to be, uh, and I was going to be uh, seeking a job in the big eight at that time, accounting industry. And I am so glad I didn't. I would not have been a good accountant. Um, and, uh, and so instead, uh, I had the opportunity to interview for a, a job uh, at the Retirement Systems of Alabama. And, but before that, my father, who had been uh, very supportive all those years, said to me, Anne, the best job you're ever going to get is down at the mall working. And I went, I don't think so, Dad. I'm going to do better than that. And years later, he said, you know, Anne, I was wrong. You're a risk taker. And that's a piece of advice I'd give to other people, too. Be willing to take a risk on yourself. And, uh, and he said, it's really worked for you all these years. So overcoming challenges is about self-belief. It's about trying to pursue what you know you want to do, having confidence, and, um, and being willing to put yourself out there uh, in a way that says, oh, I'm not going to take what you say about me. I'm not going to take no for an answer. I'm going to go and do what I need to do and be focused uh, on that. All right, we'll ask a follow up question about your risks. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a story and a time when you had to take a risk in your career? And how did that impact your career trajectory? Absolutely. So, being in the investment management business um, back in 19, I want to say it was about 1994. Um, I had been on a pretty straight line to advancement in the investment management business. Um, and I was, at that time, uh, managing private credit, a hot topic today, private credit. Uh, so I've been doing it for decades. Um, and, uh, and there came an opportunity to post for, that term of art at the time, you know, apply for a position to run a third-party asset management business for my then employer. And I thought, wow, I want to see if I can do this. I want to see if I can run a business, be a revenue generator. Um, and uh, it's one thing to be an investment professional and an analyst and a, and a really successful portfolio manager, but to, to sort of pivot into an area that I had no knowledge of. I didn't have any training in marketing or sales or running a business or a group of people. I had really not even been a manager 
up until that point in time. And, uh, and so I took a risk. I applied for the position, and I even had, here we go again, people telling me, what are you doing that for? Uh, I had a colleague of mine, who was one of the senior uh, portfolio managers, said, oh, Ann, you're, you're on a great career tra trajectory. Just keep going on investment management. What do you want to go run that business for? And I said, because I want to show that I can, and I want to build it. And I took the job, I got the job, and what do you know? Um, within two years, it turned into $10 billion of assets under management. Um, and, and after that, I was like, yeah, I can run a business. I can be a revenue generator. And it has held me in good stead because today at Guggenheim Investments, you know, we run a very large business. And I can tell you that the skills that I learned doing that, well, by the way, it was a big risk. I'd not done it before. And there's a little bit of terror that goes with that too. I mean, you're not really sure what you can be able to do. You just know you have confidence in yourself to do it. And, uh, and that risk has held me, as I said, all these years later in good stead. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm clapping. <laughs> so I wanna pivot a little bit into your work with Girls Who Invest and how much Guggenheim Partners has really been an advocate for it. What really got you into wanting to support the next generation of women investment professionals? And more importantly is obviously Guggenheim Partners is so involved in it. What can organizations do to better support not only women that want to pursue careers in finance, but women who want to pursue careers in general and being able to, really being able to do that? So, uh, uh, several levels to the answer. So mm -hmm. let's start with the image of the investment management industry or financial mm -hmm. services more broadly. Um, and this is something I try and educate folks about, which is when we are the stewards of people's assets, this is a very important and purposeful business. We are fiduciaries. We are obligated to safe keep and caretake the essential part of somebody's life savings. They're gonna put their money to work for their kids' education or, or, their, uh, or their retirement uh, or some important savings, like they wanna buy a house. That's a very purposeful industry. Sadly, the image that financial services have, uh, thanks to the media in some part, um, because it makes for good movies, is greed is good. And, um, and Wolf of Wall Street, and, uh, and an image of people who are trying to take advantage of others. And so guess what happens when your image is that? You don't attract people who want a purposeful business to join. And today, particularly young people um, who want life purpose, uh, young uh, and, and of course women, I mean, we care about what we wanna do uh, and we wanna make sure that it has value. Um, and so the first thing that really came to my attention is why aren't women coming into the industry, number one, and then why aren't they staying? Well, the first reason they're not coming into the industry, I think, is, is the image of the industry, and they don't really know what it is that we do and how we do it. They also don't recognize, perhaps, that there's no better way to measure objectively how you're doing every day because you know, you're gonna get your performance results at the end of every day. They get printed in the newspaper every night, you know, that, that you know, net asset value change. So it's like you get a, you know, a, a report card every day and a way objectively to measure your success. And by the way, that's fantastic for women because there's no question, it's not a subjective kind of thing. You either did really great or maybe you need to improve, but, but it's very objective. And I think that's really important for women too. Um, and, uh, and so it really came, and as I mentioned the statistics a little while ago, about how underrepresented women are in the industry. I will also say this, the reason women leave the industry is because um, they discovered, uh, you know, and I, I've heard it all, you know, women leave the industry because they're on the mommy track and they, you know, they gotta raise their family and they wanna get out of the business. No, that's not it. I mean, that may be some but it's not really the real reason. The real reason is the way management happens in our industry. And it is because for the most part, 
and they've done studies on what they call women-led um, industries relative to male-led industries. So accounting, law, finance, male-led industries historically, women-led industries, um, uh, you know, nursing, education, et cetera. How do they collectively make decisions? How do they, um, how do they manage? Well, historically, male-dominated ind industries were command and control management styles. They constantly moved the goalposts around so that you were never really kind of settled in sort of set as a, a set of objectives. Whereas women managed industries or led industries traditionally were more collaborative in their decision making. They're more team oriented. So at Guggenheim, we have a team based collaborative investment management process. Um, it's very differentiated and it's based in the work of Dr. Danny Kahneman, who won the Nobel Prize in economics, even though he was a psychologist, is a psychologist. Um, because, and this is also important part, diverse, thoughtful teams coming together make better decisions and we have better outcomes. Now the proof is in the pudding and we just award, got awarded the number one taxable bond fund family in the US for two out of the last four years. We just won this year's award um, as a demonstration of the importance of having this team-based collaborative uh, thought process in investment management. The outcomes are better, the studies are clear, and it's not just us, but others that employ these thought processes. So back to the question about why girls who invest, it's because I want to attract women into the industry and I want us to stay in the industry. And I want us to lead differently than we have in the past. And again, speaking uh, from Guggenheim's perspective, I'm joined in our mission by our, one of our co-presidents, Dina DiLorenzo. Both of us have been with the firm for many, many years. Dina, almost 20, me, almost, well, 17 now. So, um, and, and we really believe in our mission and, uh, and we're really trying hard to, to change the paradigm in financial services. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. And so when you were looking at, you know, you and Dina DiLorenzo, you're in the C-suite, you are managing partners, you're helping to really shape what is Guggenheim Partners as an organization that empowers its employees, its women. I really wanted to know what are the most critical qualities for that success and maintaining that success in the C-suite? And how can other aspiring leaders in this room develop those qualities? So... I, I think a level of never-ending intellectual curiosity is a key uh, element for success, certainly in our business. Um, uh, I'm a lifelong learner, uh, and you know, I, I certainly started out having a lot of degrees uh, you know, sequentially over the course of time, but I kept it up. I, I went and got an M executive MBA, which held me in great stead. Um, I think uh, also for women, education is a differentiator. Uh, an accelerant to our careers. Uh, so I highly am a proponent of that uh, as well. Um, but, but I think, um, again, uh, tenacity, passion, um, and purpose uh, are also critical aspects of success. Um, because especially for those of you in the room who uh, have an entrepreneurial business, um, you're gonna have to spend a lot of time uh, and effort and be very passionate and very tenacious in order to be successful. I see you over there, really. Yes. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, you know, we're really going to have to uh, keep at it, um, but always have that intellectual curiosity. Um, one thing that uh, I could tell you from my, 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 my perspective as well as my colleague Dina, there's one sentence that absolutely will just make our skin crawl, and that's, why did you do this? Well, that's the way we've always done it. Mm -mm. No, 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 that's not the answer. Um, and, uh, and so uh, being innovative and thoughtful uh, are also important ingredients uh, to, you know, to success. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, really now that you're in the C-suite and you've been there for so long, what were some of the actions that you took in order to get there? Um, <laughs> survival skills. <laughs> <laughs> It's a little joke, but sort of not really. Um, uh, it, it, is, it is motivating for people to see others that are similar. Um, and, uh, and there's a lot of frustration in a world where that doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. 
so uh, Dean and I uh, were the first female managing partners at Guggenheim Partners. Um, and, uh, and, and I, I tell you that is very important to motivate others in the firm, uh, in particular women, to see that this opportunity exists. Mm -hmm. um, so what are some of the things that I did to get there? Um, uh, well, managing well um, other people and teams to excellence and outcomes um, that uh, really aligned with the interest and business model that we have, uh, I think are really critical. Before I came to Guggenheim, however, I was also the chief investment officer at my predecessor firm, Reinsurance Group of America, which is the US's largest life reinsurance company. And, um, and, and I was also in the C-suite there. Both environments, as the backdrop of financial services suggests, there were not very many women. Um, and, uh, and I was uh, one of the first C-suite holders uh, also at RGA. Um, and, and breaking barriers and the willingness to break barriers uh, is, is really a hallmark to getting into the C-suite. Um, and, uh, and, and the willingness to, to, um, to do what it takes. Mm -hmm. uh, as you know, Kat, from growing up in our household, I work a lot of hours. Um, and, and for all of those who want to know what's work-life balance look like, it doesn't. Um, sorry, I got asked this question by one of the girls who invest uh, candidates, uh, you know, members uh, last summer, and, and, and she asked me, how did work-life balance work out? I said it didn't. Um, and, uh, and, and she looked a little sad. <laughs> I'm sorry. But, but on any given day, it's a push and a pull. Um, you know, you have to dedicate a lot of time to your career um, and be willing to make sacrifices there. But also, you have to also dedicate to those uh, parts of your life that are super important. And family is, the, uh, to me, still the most utmost uh, important. Um, and, uh, and, and, but you have to balance it some way, but it's not a 50-50. On any given day, it doesn't work out that way. Um, and so I would say it takes a lot to get into the C-suite. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's not a given. Um, and, uh, and honestly, I, I, there was one, one point in time at Guggenheim, I thought it would never happen uh, with regard to my uh, becoming a managing partner. And I was so glad to be proved wrong. And then, I love that answer. <laughs> and then, because I, I remember that actually, <laughs> I remember that growing up. And then in terms of you know, all of the incredible women leaders in this room, both aspiring, current, what are some of the best pieces of advice that you would love to share with them, particularly in your four decades of investment management professional and then being in the C-suite as long as you have? Um, one piece of advice I give to a lot of people is get out of your comfort zone. Um, and you know, you can say be a risk taker, but it's a little bit different. Um, it's whether you decide to make a pivot in your career, make a change. Um, sometimes you have to get out of your comfort zone to grow, um, not to get stuck in one place or one paradigm. Um, I have moved jobs over the course of my multi-decade long career, and I've moved geographies in order to make that happen. Um, and, uh, and, and it's worked for me. Um, I'm invested in me. Um, and, uh, and so when I didn't feel the opportunity where I was at, where I was, I w you, know, you could tell, you can call it a glass ceiling, you can call it whatever, but some of this is based on the job that you're in. Um, for example, uh, if I stopped learning, I felt like I wasn't learning anything new, I couldn't add additional value, there wasn't growth in my either career or person, um, I'd say, you know, it's probably time to move on. I don't feel you know, enough happening here for me personally. Or if I didn't feel validated um, or rewarded. Um, it, there's no shame in saying to oneself, you know, this isn't working for me anymore. Again, invest in yourself, but also know what your value is. And it's okay to move on from that. Um, and, uh, and, and I think that, that as long as you keep some basic principles foremost in your, in your thought process, uh, I think you can move forward uh, applying those in all sorts of different situations. But first, it means you have to move out of your comfort zone. Uh, and I'm a bit of a change agent. It kind of comes with the territory. 
Um, and, uh, and, and I try not to create change for change's sake. Obviously, I've been at Guggenheim for 17 years, so for a while I haven't m moved on in terms of location, but I've certainly seen the growth of our firm and our team and even myself in the last number of years. So there was no reason to exit the firm at that point, but I know prior in my career, there certainly was. And so that's probably the best advice I have for, for folks when they want to think about where they're going in the future. Mm -hmm. All right, so we have about 20-ish minutes left. Um, we can open it up for questions early if anyone would like to be able to ask Mrs. Walsh anything, um, or I can just keep, or we can keep going. Yeah. There's yes. questions. I'll repeat the question. Um, yes, so um, in my career, were there times where my voice wasn't being heard or I felt like it wasn't being heard? Um, and I can tell you um, there were several times. Uh, I will sort of set the stage by saying, as the only female in the room for many years, um, I didn't suffer because I'm sort of loud, um, but I didn't really suffer from what I know a lot of other women have had, which is the, let me just talk over this one woman or repeat what she said as if it was something, an original thought and take credit for it. That happens to women all the time. And I've seen it in meetings with others and I won't let it happen. Um, but when I wasn't being, uh, when I wasn't being, uh, hurt, being heard, um, yeah, there was uh, specific examples. Um, in my, one particular instance, and I don't want to take the story to be too long, but you just sort of set up the, the, the background, but, but um, uh, there was a, back in the early 1990s, there was a financial crisis, the savings and loan crisis in the US. Um, and uh, one of my colleagues had made a very bad investment choice. Uh, and it cost the firm $2 million in losses. And they uh, came to me, my management came to me, and they said, and what, what can you do? We need to make this up. And I said, well, I happen to be running a convertible bond uh, and preferred stock portfolio, which was having great gains. And I said, well, I can sell one of my holdings and pick up $2 million of gains to offset it. Great. But... I didn't get rewarded. I didn't get the attaboy, nice job, way to go for the team. In fact, on my next review, because it was the, the, the problem was really with the colleague, um, you know, I got told that I wasn't respecting senior management. And I went, it's been nice, gotcha. Now, so there are times and you have to make judgment calls at that point in time as to whether this is a small incident or whether it's part of a larger problem in the organization that I can't overcome. And in that particular case, I said I wasn't growing, I wasn't learning, and I can't overcome this. Thank you so much. Um, try not to let this intimidate me. <laughs> um, the investment management business is so competitive. It's so saturated. I'm curious as to how you define those specific characteristics, traits, winnings that you would, how you would qualify those qualities as to how you got the client versus the many, many, many competitors going after the same. You know, competing for business is a very hard uh, thing to do. Um, uh, it takes a lot of uh, grit uh, and time um, and uh, and I think that in perseverance, uh, we win as many as we lose, uh, probably more because it's, there's a lot of firms out there. Um, but having, having a story to tell that is, resonates and is compelling um, uh, is very important. And it's not just the performance results, which by the way, are, you know, in terms of Guggenheim are very strong, but it's also what makes us um, day in and day out, be able to perform. And we created a mantra uh, in uh, Guggenheim some years ago um, that sort of described uh, what we try and tell investors. Our investment process is, and our returns are predictable, repeatable, scalable, and explainable. And in that way, um, what we found is, is that it's, that our process is it, per, uh, uh, it, it perseveres, it, it is, the process itself is not changed in 20 years. Um, the market conditions change, the thought 
uh, leadership has not. And that's very compelling for investors. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, you know, the, the, the uh, team and collaborative-based decision-making resonates because it is not dependent on any one single individual. The process has, been, uh, has worked through multiple cycles. And that, is, uh, that helps for, uh, to frame for investors the differentiation of our, of our style. And I think that's, you know, that, that helps to make the decisions. I have a question back here. Thank you so much, Mrs. Walsh, for speaking and coming here today. Um, Sorry, where are, oh, there you are. I'm in the, <laughs> there we go. hanging in the back. Uh, question about earlier on in your career, how did you go about finding allies and mentors when you're surrounded by managers and colleagues who don't look like you and aren't necessarily disposed to identify with you? So great question. Um, uh, I, I didn't really have mentors. We didn't really have mentors back then. Um, uh, we, but I did have role models, people who I emulated, who I deeply respected, men and women. Um, mostly at that time men, though. Um, and, uh, and, and I adopted the parts of their success that I could model for myself. Education um, uh, was one of them. Um, and in fact, my very first boss at the Retirement Systems of Alabama, all these years later, he's still there, uh, Dr. Bronner. Um, and he encouraged all of the team members to get as educated as possible. So I just started sequencing a number of degrees uh, uh, in line. Um, but later, um, there's a book written by uh, Sheryl Sandberg called Lean In. And some people like or don't like the book, but there's some aspects to it I think are very helpful. And one of them was to create your own board of directors. And what I figured out after I read the chapter was I had already done that. I just didn't have a label for it. And that was I sort of collected people over the course of time who had had influence, positive influence in my career. Um, and, and we stayed friends. And when I had a need to have a sounding board or advice, um, I didn't really call it mentoring, but I went back to them as advisors. And most of those were former bosses of mine over the course of time, but also friends uh, who had been successful in their own lines of business, um, maybe not in financial services. Um, and I found that, uh, that sort of trying to do that myself ended up working very, very well. I also then had a lot of um, uh, input and or control of how those interactions went. And I will talk a moment about mentoring. Um, I, I, I think mentoring as a word is sort of overused. Um, sponsorship is better. What's the difference? Sponsorship means I take an interest in you individually. I help you motivate and move around in your career over the course of your of your time and your and and what can I do to actually help you? Can I make an introduction? Can I move your resume along? What can I actually do? Whereas I think mentoring is a little weaker. Um, and you know I can give you advice and then I can walk away. Um, and technically I've mentored you. And uh, and so I like to I like to take it to the next level. Um, and that's what my board of directors did for me. And um, and I highly recommend that that you take that chapter out of a book and and use it. Good morning. Thank you for sharing your story. I'm also in financial services, so it's super inspiring to see a role model of what's possible in the career journey. My question is, I just read an article the other day from Bloomberg saying that many firms are quietly shutting down their DEI efforts um, in faces of challenges and people who are opposed to it because supposedly DEI efforts are shutting down another part of the population out of the equation. So sitting at your seat and having done all the things that you've accomplished, what would you say to those who are against the, these efforts and how to bring them along to the train and still be a supporter for it? Thank you. So I think that there's this sort of politically charged backdrop to the term diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, I know I've referenced our team-based approach. Well, the best outcomes come from diverse thinking, diverse ideas, diverse team makeup, people with different backgrounds. So regardless of whether companies are interested in using the term DEI, 
um, or they're facing a political backlash from some of their audiences. The truth is, is that firms are in their best interest to continue absolutely expanding their workforce and broadening the workforce regardless. And whether they actually keep the label or not, the effort is absolutely there. And smart firms are going to make those decisions. And I've talked to other C-suite uh, firm uh, leaders across the industries, not just in my own, and, um, and, and they'll all agree. You make the best decisions if you have a diverse workplace. You make the, and you get the best outcomes from people. Um, and, um, but I think the labeling has become problematic for some because of, of and I think a couple of the terms, um, affirmative action as part of diversity, it's like you don't have to have a quota system. You just have to have a goal. Just bring in people from all walks, and and uh, and and the outcomes will be better. The term equity tends to be politically charged as well, relative to the old term equality. And what does it really mean? Um, and and again, I, I think that 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 in our firm we are absolutely focused on continuing to build our collaborative, diverse teams and. We're not, you know, we're not, uh, we're not going to limit ourselves. I actually think if you aren't pursuing diversity, you're limiting yourself as an organization. That's, you know, full stop. Good morning. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us. Um, I've been in financial services uh, for a while myself, and uh, one of the constants in finance is change. So for many of us, as we complete our degrees or as we look to move into the workforce, where do you see the investment management business evolving in the next 10 years? And how can we future-proof ourselves for those of us that are interested in rising in this industry? What, what should we put in our toolkit to future-proof ourselves? Sure. So several things. Great question. Um, you know, I, I talk a lot about the what I might refer to as the softer skills. Um, but let's start out with I was an accounting undergrad, um, and it's still about actually being a really good analyst to start with, being able to make good decisions. But um, the the capital markets in the U.S. are undergoing a fundamental change. Um, we have moved away from being a public market world to a private capital world. And, um, and just by another few numbers, there are now about 3,600 listed companies in the US. There are now more listed ETFs on the stock exchange than there are actual listed companies. And there are about 5,500 private equity owned companies out there. And the crossover point occurred, I don't know, approximately seven years ago. Um, where we started to see more and more private equity uh, companies uh, come, to, uh, uh, you know, come to be. So private equity companies don't issue public bonds or public, you know, obviously, unless they go IPO, they're not issuing the public stock market. And by, by, by the way, 80% of all private equity owned companies are sold to another private equity shop. They don't end up actually getting IPO'd in. So they're not really going into the public markets. So this huge change in the markets has occurred, more and more capital is moving into private providers. And I think that's a very important trend in the US. I can't leave without speaking about artificial intelligence. It is game changing in our industry. Particularly, I like to think of it not so much as replacing us as investment professionals. I tend to think of it more as the augmented intelligence. So augmented intelligence making us help us to get better decisions made. Um, to synthesize the vast, enormous amount of data that we have to process in order to, uh, to be able to make good investment decisions. I mean, it's, a, it, it's, it's remarkable that in a 24-7 news cycle, how much news is coming at us all the time. And being able to separate you know, uh, you know, real information and value information from the noise um, is important, and artificial or augmented intelligence is going to be able to help us with that. So those are two very critical changes that are happening in our industry. 
Thank you so much for being here. This is really inspiring for me, especially having your daughter, which you have an 18-year-old that <laughs> I always um, perform in a way that I want to be a role model. One of my questions is related to that exact, the family. You know, at the end of the day, we're mothers and we want to not succeed at the cost to our kids. So if you could share some of the rules and conversations with your daughter and how you guys worked it out. You know, your daughter is doing great. You know, she's a rising star. So um, if you could share that, that would be... Appreciate Thank you. So um, the best part of my life is my daughter um, and uh, and my family, and um, and it is true. Uh, when so, Cat has been on, on a uh, uh, been with me to travel. Yep. So I travel extensively, and from time to time, I get the pleasure of bringing Cat with me. And uh, on her 25th birthday, we were in Davos uh, at the World Economic Forum in the off cycle. Uh, post-COVID event in May, um, and she had a room full of people sing happy birthday to her. Um, and so, uh, you know, integrating her into my life has been, uh, as much as possible, has been a, a very good way to try and balance work and, and, and family. Um, and, uh, and so when you take your daughter to work day and, and we're on CNBC, that was fun. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, that, that's kind of a, it, it's, it's, it, it's just trying to make sure that, that she was part of my life, but I was also part of hers. And um, the cat, for those of you who don't know, was an elite diver, and she dove for UCLA undergrad as well. Um, and so there were many, many, many tr uh, trips uh, to take her to various sporting events where I would be sitting in the in the bleachers uh, with a laptop working away, and people would say, Kat, where's your mom? She's up there, she's the one with the laptop. Um, and, uh, and, and so, you know, I wanted to be present as much as possible. Uh, and, you know, and I just established those boundaries um, throughout my career. There were just things I wouldn't give on. Like I said, on any given day, it's 90, 10, 10, 90, whatever work or family. But I made sure that I prioritized what needed to be prioritized relative to, no, I can let that stuff go for a few days. And, um, and so um, I think that was important. I also um, happen to have been blessed with uh, a family of, uh, of very close-knit women. Um, my grandmother, my mom, your grandmother, mm -hmm. um, and us, and, um, and we, dare I say, we just didn't suffer from a lot of that angst um, because we were so close and, um, and you know, got along so amazingly well. Uh, I never had the, the, the mid-teens angst, proud mother here, um, and, uh, uh, and, and, but I never gave it to my mother either. So it was just something that was generationally important to us as a, as a family that, that, uh, that the women bonded. Um, and so we were able to carry that forward as well. So, so it's, been, it's been a great journey. Uh, and I would, I would tell people, you know, set your boundaries, make sure your family is prioritized, and then also you know, carry forth what's the priorities in, in, and, uh, and, and act accordingly. I think, I think we're right. out of time. I think we're out of time, everyone. <laughs> Yeah, well, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.